Okay, please, Mateo, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Thank you all of you for being here, also from home. I'm very happy uh, to be able to present you about uh, these topics that are really uh, my core of interest in my research in the past years and in the future, I think. We are going to talk about the graph power data exploration. Uh, there is an entire different part uh, that is still related to this that I work with, uh, that is graph database, graph database systems and performance. This is not part of today. So how to make these techniques actually work in practice on large scale. Today we are talking about, so one part is the system, the database system, the software that make this run. The other part is how can help users to get to the information they need. And this part is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So graph power, big data exploration. And I start, <laughs> I wanted to start. Oh, because we assume you need to click once and then shoot. Right Let's see if it's true. Okay. Yes, we got it. So, and I want to start from big data. If you go to any company in the past five years, and probably for the next uh, 15, they are all crazy about big data because this is this big vision. We are handling big amounts of data from all the sources we can think of that are around a company, a business, or an organization. And then, given all this information, is like a superpower. We can really get do anything and predict anything and get all information you want. And this is the vision. But when you actually go talk with these people, the situation looks a bit different. It's more like this. We are drawing a set of data, yes, but there is no information here. We don't know how to find what we're looking for. We don't even have the idea if what we are looking for is inside here somewhere. My answer to this is in three points. The, third, the first one is, of course, big data exploration. The second one is semantic data that you may have heard of in Kill code as knowledge graphs. And then semantic data exploration. So, and the intersection between the two. And what, what is this about? And this is what we are going to, to, to talk next as well. Uh, overview about the goals of this lecture. Uh, I want to motivate you about why data exploration is so important and vital nowadays and what kind of types of data exploration exist, and what are the use cases, and uh, what, we, what we need at each stage of the process. And then what is this example-driven data exploration? Uh, today I will, I will talk about graphs and knowledge graphs specifically, but a lot of these principles apply also for other data models, the relational data models, or documents and unstructured data as well. So let's talk about data exploration and let's start from what we know very well. You, I think all of you took the database one course. So you know that you can design a database, um, all the relationship, uh, the primary keys, all the attributes, and you optimize, you make sure there are no redundancy, and so on. So this is still true and very relevant. This is a big engineering job. And uh, when we can do that, then we have a database that we know very well and which we have optimized for some specific business tasks that we want to get to the answer as fast as possible, as precisely as possible. So in that case, we know the data, we have designed the database, we know the task, somebody gave us very clear requirements, and we know how to ask for it. We start the queries and the algorithms to get to the answer. Very fast. Nowadays, things are a little bit different, though, because now we have big data. Big data, the first thing is, of course, volume, meaning that, of course, we have a lot of data coming, but we are actually integrating data from many different sources. Uh, within a, within a, just the same business, we have many departments, and we want to aggregate all data from all the departments. These departments do not talk to each other. But or even if we are aggregating data from the web or from social media as well. So yes, we have a lot of data coming, but we don't know what, what is getting. And new people, a new marketing department, or actually a new manager say, let's get this data, let's buy this data, let's add it somewhere. So now, the first part that is that we don't know anymore what we have. And second is that there is a democratization of access to data, meaning that, again, just within the same organization, without trying to go far away, um, there are many different people that want to have access directly to the data that the business has. So in the marketing department, the managers, uh, social media manager, or even uh, the 
production department or lawyers, they want to see the data directly. They don't want to go to a data engineer, give requirements, wait for the design and so on. That's too slow. They want to have access directly. But now these people have just a big idea of what is the data that the business should have. What is exactly how to query for it is uh, above uh, the, the skills, the capabilities, the knowledge. But then there is also information needs that now are more vague. So in this case, we have in the legal department, they found that there was an account that was fraudulent. Okay, uh, we need to fix this, of course, but are there any other accounts that are fraudulent between my customers? How do I answer this question? How do I find the information? How do I define what is a uh, fraudulent account? So this is the issue we have and we face daily with any company organization. And here comes that exploration. So exploration is something that is very human since the uh, dawn of time, because it's all the cases where we are in a new environment and we know the starting point, but we don't know what we are going to find and we don't know how we're going to find. So the idea that this data exploration is a gradual process of discovery and understanding, and in our case of big large uh, data sets. In practice, this has three, three, three goals. Uh, obtain a better understanding of unfamiliar data, support formulation of new hypotheses, and guide future in that analysis. Data exploration is at the beginning of any data intensive process. And we can, uh, let's say, organize the data exploration need among three main uh, families. The first one is summarization and profile. So, in general, how much data do I have? Uh, what are the attributes? Uh, how many records? Where they are stored? How they are stored? Profiling information. Then we have on the opposite exploratory search, meaning that, okay, this is the account that is fraudulent. What kind of information I know about this specific account? Uh, do I have past transaction? Do I know when they register? Do I have any contact information? This is the idea that we start from somewhere and we are going to search for more and more information about a specific data point. In the middle, we have exploratory analytics. Exploratory analytics uh, is uh, a middle ground between the two. On one side, we want to get some in depth information about the specific aspects, but we don't want to go down to the data point. We are trying to have some summary, some trends, or some outliers here. So, this is my average customer. These customers are actually outside the other clients. When we structure a bit more these three families, so summarization profiling, exploratory analytics, exploratory search, we can put them in this continuum that there are uh, um, that describes uh, different dimensions and different characteristics. First, about the other that I already told you. On one side, when profiling and summarization only provides a high-level overview of what is in the data set. On the opposite side. Export research provide very detailed answers about specific parts. And as I said, data exploration and uh, analytics are in the middle. So we have an overview of specific aspects. But then we can also look at what are the what is the domain knowledge that each one of these uh, require from the user. So if we look at summarization and profiling, well, this is where we start for the first time when we meet our data for the first time. We know nothing. So we don't have domain knowledge. And with these techniques, we don't require any domain knowledge because we're going to get some initial domain knowledge. On the opposite, if we want to do a spark research, we need to know specifically what they're looking for, like the user account, for instance. And again, if you're doing sport analytics, we need at least some domain knowledge to understand what are the aspects that we are investigating. And finally, there is another dimension that is how interactive and personalized uh, this approach needs to be. On one side, again, we have no domain knowledge and we provide a level overview. These are not interactive at all. It's just, okay, give me the broad picture of my data set. And that's it. Exploratory search is extremely interactive and extremely personalized because the legal department is looking at some information about the customer, but the marketing department is looking at different information. This will be personalized based on the user need. And at the same time, it's very interactive. We keep interacting, we keep finding, okay, maybe this, maybe that. 
and again, the desperation analytics are uh, in the middle. I am going to focus on the second two, uh, sport analytics and sport research. I don't want you to leave too much behind with the data profiling, but just to give a broad idea of this set of techniques, there is also all the part, all the techniques that are about data cleaning. And uh, any people that works in a company tells you that 80% of their job is data cleaning. A lot of errors, a lot of mistakes, a lot of attributes uh, that are the wrong name or no name at all, and we need to understand them, and general profiling and visualization. This is still there. And they are just about initial overview. When you move to the other tool, the tool changes drastically. And first of all, they need to be very powerful tool, and they exist. We know them. They are the queries. SQL, SparkQL, graph query languages, they are very powerful. But they are very complex. And when we don't know the data that we're dealing with, is even if we are expert in how to write SQL queries or Spark query queries, if we don't know what are the attributes, what are the predicates, what are the connections, we are not able to write the queries that we need. Here we talk about data novice. So it's not a novice because of technical skills, but it's a novice because they don't know the data starting. And at any point, a lot of people are data novice. So how can we solve this? Well, technically, of course, we can start with simple queries. We can all write this kind of queries, select everything from joining these tables. Very easy. Problem, we are swamped by results and we don't know what we are looking at. The, these queries do not provide the information we need. We will need this kind of queries that are specific and obtain the information we need, but they, they only retrieve what is specific to us if we are able to ask for it. How do we write these conditions? That is the issue we are trying to solve. So, as I was saying, today and tomorrow we are going to focus on exploratory search and exploratory analytics. Most of it will be about exploratory search because that's where the abundance of literature and methods exist. When we come to exploratory analytics, methods are very limited. So there, there is not, not much for me to talk about there, fortunately, and that's where my research is going moving forward. So let's start with exploratory search and the intuition behind it. The intuition is that when we are doing exploratory research, we start from something that we know that is relevant to us. We found this account that's a fraudulent account. Find me something like this. That's something we can ask easily. The problem is that the system now needs to understand it. So we can use the example in place of a complex query and we offload to the system all the problems and challenges in understanding what does it mean like this. The issue is in the similarity. So if we know how to interpret the sentence like this, that is easy. If we know how to compute what is similar and for the user, what is similar for the user, um, then we can find all the other elements. So we can just compare all the similarities and return them. That would be the goal. And that is where the challenge is. So let me be slightly more formal on what is this by example paradigm. <laughs> the example based search problem starts with a universe of items among which the user provides us few examples that they know they are relevant for them. And the challenge there is to identify the similarity relation that allow us to find only the answers that are relevant to the user. So these answers are within the set that are similar to the similarity relation to what the user provides. So what we can use as a similarity, how to do it efficiently are the two challenges. When we talk about similarity relationships, there are two broad, broad, categories, broad categories. The first one is implicit similarity relationship. It means that we don't know what is the similarity relationship. We only have the item the user provides. And it is our task to reverse engineer, to infer it from the examples. There are other methods instead that allow us to have an explicit generic similarity relationship. And then, given the user input, we parameterize it. So on one, on one side, we have reverse engineering queries. So I provide you the output of a query, and the system is going to reverse engineer, figure out what was the query to this output. 
On the other side, for instance, we have structural similarity. So I have this structure with these specific parameters, find other structures that have the same, other subgraphs, for instance, or other objects that have the same structure. There are uh, slides on the other methods because this exists for relational, graph, textual, and there are also machine learning approaches to this. And if you go on data exploration.ml, you will uh, find the slides with the additional uh, methods that I'm not going to explain today. There's also uh, a book that maybe you can ask the library to get for you if you want to look at it. And now I'm going to move forward with this uh, with approach that are further research example based for graph data. So very briefly, semantic data knowledge graph. I think uh, Professor uh, Sibello already introduced you uh, to most of that. So we go very quick here, but if you have questions, uh, stop me anytime. And they start, the power of graphs start again in big data, not about volume now, but about variety. So when we are introducing and integrating large sets of data from many different sources, we have a, a problem that how we can integrate them, reconcile them. They are very different schemas and data. And that's where the power of graph takes, uh, takes the, 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 the shift road because graphs are flexible enough to integrate all this data and represent many different data within a single model. And graphs are actually everywhere. This, if you go to any database machine learning conference, somebody will have this slide, at least in every session. Because they're actually using everywhere. We know, of course, knowledge graph, social networks, but there are very specific graphs that are used to represent the customer networks or from the interaction network, chemical networks, and so on. So the graph model is expressive and flexible enough in, to be applied in all these domains. About this, the graph model, we recognize the core components, of course, the nodes and the edges. In a knowledge graph, we have labels, so we can represent the semantics of the connections. And then we can additionally recognize our different parts, the fact part, the fact graph, so the instances, and the ontology tree, so all the high-level uh, connection between concepts. Mathematically speaking, we talk, we're talking about edge-labeled multigraphs, because we can also have multiple edges between the same two nodes. You know already the RTF um, model. Uh, there, are, there is the property graph model uh, as well. The core concept that I want you to uh, rem remember about is the structure of the graph is as important as the data that I'm storing. So it's not just about the data values, it's how they are connected, which structures, in uh, which shape. And you will find that industries are using it uh, more and more every day. These are three articles from the communication of the ACM that are just big silver. You can look at about why graphs are have a primary role nowadays. And these are just components that use today knowledge graph in very different shapes for very for very different goals. So let's move to the core of the lecture here, semantic data exploration. And uh, again, the core components, we are talking about example-driven exploration. And we're talking about this because it helps user to find information when they have a vague understanding of what they are looking for, when they have a vague understanding of the data, it allows them to avoid completely most of the cases to actually write any query at all. So it allows also data novice and novice people that I mean are not skilled in how to uh, write a case to actually get the information without having all the skills. The example query problem, uh, I, will, I will show you now different techniques, but they all follow more or less uh, this skeleton. There is a set of elements of input that are the user query, which uh, are then uh, using it as, as, as a query, as, as, uh, as an input. And then we have a similarity relationship that determines which other element needs to be retrieved. And the element can be nodes or entities, uh, single edges, or entire graph structure or, or parts. 
And there is this process where from the user query, you need to find the samples in the graph that match the user query. There is this uh, resolution part. Given this part, we apply the similarity relationship to find all the possible answers. But in many cases, especially in graphs, the result set uh, are very, very large. So in this case, what we're going to do is try to restrict the output to only those subsets that are the most relevant to the user query. We will see methods that, again, users input nodes, and the similarity can be just about proximity, so connected, connectedness in the, in the graph. We can look also about properties, so the attributes of the, mm -hmm. of the nodes. Or we can look at input structures, uh, so subgraphs in practice. And then we can see how we can use a similarity query. So this is one of those cases where we're going to have reverse engineering a query that selects a graph. Or just look at the relationship, the structural relationships, and, and their semantics. Uh, the challenges again, understand why the user is providing these elements. What is that makes them relevant? And then, of course, there, there is a big challenge in how do we make this efficient? The most, the most simple and intuitive exploratory search in a graph is um, that of, in a social network, for instance, we have few users that we know are relevant for us, maybe few answers, and we want to find what community, what are all the other nodes that are relevant because part of the same community, so relevant, sense of highly connected. So we are using proximity as a similarity. This is called uh, seed set expansion because we have some seed and we want to expand the seed. And the solution in this case is um, to use what is called personalized page rank. I don't know if you've seen already page rank, but personalized page rank is a um, version of page rank is skewed, skewed towards the user preference. How does this work? In the global page rank, which is used and was used by Google to rank uh, web pages on the internet, we are trying to find nodes that are relevant because they are highly connected on a global scale. Page rank is this random walk model where we start from a node and then we take a random jumps in the neighbors. And at some point we stop. And the question is, what is the node that I am at once I'm stopping? And nodes that are most frequently our stopping points are the most relevant because it means that are the most connected. But this is a global score. It means that we have a, the pages that are most important globally. If we are do, going to personalize, then we are having a teleport probability, meaning that we start from a node, we take some random jumps in neighboring nodes, but at some point I can stop and restart from where I started the first time. Those are my preference nodes, my skewed nodes. In this case, we, we are having just a local proximity, a local importance. That's the difference between global page rank and my page rank. And then personalized page rank, this can be applied to the seed set expansion. We are using the seed set at, as our restart nodes. And one important thing here is that if we are on the web, Links are links, they are all the same. There are no semantics. But if we are on a knowledge curve, different edges have different semantics. So how can we identify the relevance of different edges? Usually we are trying to uh, put a weight, and that weight needs to be user-specific or application-specific. The most uh, common approach is to weight edges uh, that are that have relationships that are the less frequent the graph, the least frequent the graph, because they are the most informal. That is a classical way to do it. Re remaining on the idea that we use proximity as a similarity, the mean wire connector problem doesn't want to find an entire community, but wants to find from nodes of the community which are the central hubs or the central nodes. So we have some nodes in the graph that we know that are relevant. For instance, people that got COVID recently. And we want to find who are the culprits 
who are the people that are probably the ones for which this was started. And again, we are trying to measure closest. So in this time, we are looking at all the shortest path distance between the original nodes. So the connector, the wider connector nodes are those that minimize all pair shortest path between all nodes. Now, when we're trying to minimize the shortest path in a graph, a uh, typical uh, problem is to build a Steiner tree. A Steiner tree is a tree that minimizes all the shortest path. But in this case, a Steiner tree is less connected than a triangle. A tree and a triangle have not the same connectivity. So in this case, we cannot work with a Steiner tree. We need to build a different kind of graph. It is not a tree. This requires to take the node, find a possible subgraph, measure all the short spot, then find a different possible subgraph, measure all the short spot, and continue every time measuring the winer index until we find the minimum one. This is, of course, uh, not, not feasible in practice. So the idea is, instead of computing all the pairwise distances, to just take a root node and compute the distance to that root node. And instead of com computing distances every time, pre-compute some shortest path in the entire graph and use those shortest path given the route that we selected. This is the overview idea. So to do some pre-computation about shortest path, and we reuse that pre-computation uh, when we have a specific thing. This is, of course, an approximation. But you will see uh, in basically all the time we are working with graph, that is the common procedure. We pre-compute some global information, we reuse that refining when the query arrives. Now, about proximity, we were looking just at the connection. But we know in graphs, we also have attributes. So we have some other information about the nodes. So when we look at the community, for instance, we have this community of people that are highly connected. But some of them have a higher similarity than others because of their attributes. So in this case, we find that there is an outlier there, for instance, because uh, this person was living somewhere else and had, had not a PhD, for instance. So we still want to find a community of people, but we want them to be also uh, cohesive in the attributes uh, they share. So this is the idea of focus cluster. In this case, the input are again nodes, but we want to uh, identify cluster of nodes that are highly connected and, and highly similar. This approach allows us also to find outliers in a community, so people that are oddly connected and they can be interesting for many different cases, for instance, for fraudulent accounts. How can we do this? The first part is that when the user provides us a set of nodes, uh, we are not sure what are the attributes that make this node interesting. That is the problem of uh, metric, uh, metric, distance metric learning. So in this case, we have all these pairs of nodes with all these attributes. We need to understand which, are, which subset of articles are those that are uh, the important one for the user. To do this, what we do is uh, we take pairs of nodes that the user provides, and we know this should be similar. And then we, took pay, we take pairs of nodes that the user did not provide, and these are randomly picked. And this should be, on average, uh, dissimilar. So they should not be similar among each other. And then we want to learn these uh, metrics that make sure that every time we compare the vectors of the nodes that are similar, those are uh, actually have a low distance. And when we compare random nodes, those should, be, should have a uh, uh, high distance. That's the idea of uh, distance metric learning. Of course, what we need to do is to minimize a function here that basically has a high, uh, a low distance, sorry, a low distance for entities that are in a similar pair. And instead, we penalize if the distance between entities that are random are, uh, have also uh, a low distance. So we want to penalize this for random nodes. And we minimize it. So we take sample of nodes 
and we repeat this until we minimize and we find the metrics that can uh, learn basically uh, how to separate similar nodes from the similar nodes. Once we have this, what we are going to do is that now that we have the symmetric pair of nodes, we can put weights on the edges. And the weight is how strong is the tie, the similarity tie between these two nodes. Given the weights on edges, then we can prune the graph. We can, we can set a threshold, minimum similarity threshold, and we can remove from the graph all edges that are below this threshold. And now we are left with some smaller uh, disconnected graphs. Among these, we find the strongly connected component. And these, again, we can use as seeds. They are seed of communities. And now we need to now bring back the other nodes because we want to grow the communities. These are just the core. Uh, to do that, we use uh, the connectivity. And uh, we use the weighted conductors. So the conductors, per se, is given a node and two graphs what is the highest connectivity within the one graph or within the other? We are measuring basically how many edges are crossing the boundary between the graphs. That is the uh, essence of the conductors. When it's weighted, we are actually not counting all edges the same, but we are uh, summing the weights. So we want that for all the edges that cross the boundary of the graph, only the low weight edges are, are, are left possible. At every time, then, we have this small seed, a small community, and we say, okay, we want to add this extra node. What is the conductors of this extra node? We, may, we measure the weight of conductors, and then we decide if the conductors is higher when we add it or when we remove it. So we keep iterating and we keep adding. And this allows us uh, to uh, grow the communities until any other node will only reduce the conductors of the graph. Now, the difference between the unweighted conductors and the weighted conductors is important here because outliers are those edges that have a high unweighted conductors. So if you just look at the edges without the attributes, they're highly connected, but they have a low weighted conductors. These are our, our outliers. Okay, we have looked at exploratory search using proximity. Any question? We are all on board. Thanks. Now let's look at properties. And uh, in this case, we are looking at similar n. We move to a model that more similar to what you know already. The Knowledge graph model where we have entities with properties that are expressed as edges, usually. Uh, in this case, again, we have a set of nodes, but now these nodes are entities of interest, and we want again to retrieve more nodes. But in this case, we are not looking at the connectivity of how close these nodes are to each other, but we look at what are the properties that describe these nodes. So for for instance, in this case, if the entities are on Schwarzenegger, we may think of uh, politicians from the US, just politicians, bodybuilders, or movie, uh, action movie actors. Now, if the user provides an additional entity is a big way, then Chuck Norris, then we can identify which one is the segment that we were, we were uh, thinking about. So that's the idea. We get a set of entities in order to find other entities that are coherent uh, for the properties that describe them. How do we do that? The first thing is we define what is called an uh, aspect set. So the set of properties or aspects that describe a specific entity. For instance, uh, Schwarzenegger is described by the fact that the sport, it, the sport he participated in was bodybuilding and the fact that he has a type that is American actor or American actor and governor of California. These two aspect sets are set of properties to describe Arnold Schwarzenegger. Both of them are defined maximum if 
by adding any other property to any of those, the only entity that we can retrieve is just the query one, the query entity. So if we search for sport bodybuilding, type American actor, and governor of California, we will only find Arnold Schwarzenegger. So these three properties together cannot go. Only a subset of the two can go together, and these are masks because is uh, adding anything else will not provide any results. Now, there are some characteristics of maximal aspects that we want. The first one is that they should all contain some types. In an MDF graph especially, they should all contain types. And usually, we need to include only the typical type, meaning that if I add there type human, uh, that will not be very informative aspect to add. So instead, American actor or action actor of California or maybe US politician, they are not descriptive. Then, so at the same time, we want to prove generic aspects. For instance, if you look for an entity that has had eight, one meter eighty-eight, you will find these people here, but also this uh, mass tag. So that's a reason why we don't want that. Uh, then the very five aspects that are uh, possibly relevant, we may want to rank them based on how many entities they contain, how specific and how specific they are. So, for instance, in this case, if we have American actor acting with expandables and we get type action actor, then we can find a small set of entities with predicates that are very specific. So this is. Um, and a set of entities that is probably very relevant for the user. What is interesting here is that this process is repeatable but interactive, meaning that the user can provide some nodes, we identify maximum aspects, we pick one that we think is relevant, we provide entities to the user there, we think this is something you like, and then the user can provide us feedback. I like this entity, I don't like this entity. With this information, we go back to the aspect set that we have retrieved and we can prove them. So this is very important because this is interactive without actually starting everything from scratch, which, as we said at the beginning, is a defining characteristic in exploratory sport research. These are four nodes, proximity and properties. Now we move to structures in the graph. And the first part is about how we can reverse engineer query given just the output. For instance, in this case, we are trying to reverse path query, reverse engineer path queries. What does it mean? The user provides the green nodes with a plus that are positive examples of nodes we want to retrieve, and the red node with the minus as a negative example. The question is what is a path query that returns? Nodes, the green nodes, and doesn't return the, the red node. That is the main idea. And a path query is a property path, is what you have basically. It means that we have a very simple um, grammar to define it. We can have, we can traverse edge and edge types. Uh, we can have or, and uh, meaning that we can go either one or the other. Or we can have concatenation steps. And we can have the cleaning start, meaning that. Repeat zero plus times. Like for instance, in this case, a possible path query is the following. These are all the nodes for which we can take a bus or a tram anytime and we can reach a cinema. That, that is a possible path query. So, this again, we are reverse engineering. So at the beginning, we're just determining the nodes. We are, we are reverse engineering the entire path query, meaning that yes, we can still return nodes, but now we are returning entire structures. But, uh, the example I gave you is about a single node, but of course we can provide pair of nodes. So path query and connect nodes from this starting point to this end point. That is also another option for this type of methods. Now, in this approach, Dif uh, different from the first two and uh, similar to the search, we the user provides positive examples, but the user can also provide negative examples. 
And this is again something uh, very important for research because then we have additional information about nodes, entities, structures, tuples that we do not want in the result set. And the first part is that we need to find what are path queries that are coherent and compatible with the set of positive and negative examples. Now, one uh, important uh, characteristic of the path query language is that we have the screening star, meaning that we can recurse uh, without limit within the graph. This uh, is a bit problematic because then uh, we don't know if we have a fixed set path. So do we want to take the bus at most five times or do we want to take the bus any arbitrary number of times? The first problem say, okay, only five times is efficient, is uh, relatively efficient to compute because we say maximum path length five. The clean star, we have loop in the graph. We don't know when to, when to stop when we are reverse engineering the query. And so in this approach, what they do is that given an application, we can set a k, a, k, a maximum length of the path uh, that is reasonable. The idea is to set k twice the average length of the path that we're looking for. And then what we're doing is that we are reverse engineering paths without the clean star. So we assume the user does not want a path query with uh, the clean star with inking repeatability. And for that kind of queries, we can build in polynomial time uh, um, an automaton that can accept uh, the language and tell us which path queries can be produced. Given this automata, which is deterministic and is uh, obtained, then there is a second process that try to relax and find loops and nodes that can be collapsed, like in this case. And in this case, we are retrieving the language with the clean start. So we first find a finite state automata for a fixed language, and then we collapse, we collapse node, we relax it to, the, to generalize the language to uh, the clean start. That's the idea here. Now we move to even complex, more complex queries to reverse engineer. These are full sparkle queries. The, the input is always the same. So we have a um, table output like a sparkle query used for you. And uh, we have entity, entity names in this case that can be matched to your eyes. <laughs> and at this point, this table can also contain empty cells. Uh, this can be empty cells because the user do not, does not know uh, what is the value for that output for that specific example. That is one case. The other case is because actually in this graph, uh, information can be complete. So we have the optional statement. So this is the input, and we want to be able to retrieve Sparkle queries that can produce exactly uh, the input that is actually the output uh, the user is looking for. Now, in general, the problem on a, on a graph is this complexity class that if someone of you knows the name, please tell me. I looked for it everywhere. I need to speak to the author to have the correct name of that. But there's some very high exponential class that is completely untractable. And uh, so we need to uh, resolve to, um, to a simpler uh, an approximation. The idea is the following. We exploit the use of, of optional and we exploit the fact that users usually only want to connect to at one hope of distance. So we start from the variable that has the most uh, number of values. And we say this is the, the, the core value, the, the core variable for which we find a binding. And then the other uh, are connected with, uh, with optional C. So we start from the initial um, binding there, and we try to find BGP queries 
that describe that binding. Then we try to find how they can be connected to the graph, the other pairs of variables. So uh, when we have man in the email, that could be the predicate that uh, connects them. Or Lucy and the Rose Street, that is the others. That is another predicate that connects them. So basically, for every column, we have different candidate uh, interpretation in the graph. What are the predicates and the BGPs that describe them? And uh, we built then this uh, three uh, lattice actually of variables that uh, provides the dependence, meaning that every time we have uh, x there, then we have at least y there, and we know in which status this appears. This appears, uh, like for instance, w appears only at the end, and only when we have z and y. For instance. So we have this dependency of when bindings appear in the table. And then we match this. So solving for the lattice is again uh, intractable in the number of interpretation we need to consider. So what we do is that we build different tree view of this lattice. And we build queries in that way. So we start from the first variable, we find the triples that match that. Then we find we go for the other two. We look at are there answers that connect results from the first to the results of the second, and and basically we prune out interpretation as we move down the tree to build. And this is a greedy approach, meaning that at any time we only have the minimum amount of uh, BGP queries uh, that. Uh, that can provide the results in the output plus some other results. Again, in, uh, in this problem, we, we start with a simple example where we only have positive input from the user, but the user can also provide positive and negative examples as well. The negative example basically are going to work as a negative in the sense that we are going to remove anything that matches those. So again, so in this case, we are reverse engineering a query from the output. So this is one of the cases where one of those cases where uh, we are we have an implicit synergy relationship, and we want to infer it from the user. There are approaches that, that work like this also for SQL queries, for instance. And in that case, we have all the project join aggregation because in that case we also have tables to join and so on. Okay, so we move now to the last set of methods about structures. I mean, we have to look. We have to do now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Questions? No questions. Now we're moving to searching for structures when the similarity relationship is given as explicit. Now, in this case, the input is not just a table, but is actually a small sample of index on the user. And the similarity relationship is some form of structural similarity and homomorphism. In this case, you can look at isomorphism or some variation of uh, simulation. The idea is that given the graph here, so here we have Google, YouTube, Menlo Park uh, connected this way, we're going to find it in the knowledge graph. And then once we found it, we want to say what are the other substructures in the graph that match the same connections, but they are also relevant for the top, meaning that returning Yahoo Tumblr Santa Clara is a better result compared to CBS Parma in New York City. We are probably looking for IT companies, not just for general US companies. And if there was some French uh, agricultural company, that would be even less relevant. So we have these two problems. First, how do we find all the substructure in the graph? Second, how do we 
uh, terming, which one is more relevant. Let's start from the simulated relationship first. So isomorphism is just exact match of the structure as it is. But simulation allows us some, uh, some approximation, some ambiguity, and it is especially important in our knowledge graph as uh, most of them we will see that the connection can vary a lot in, in shape even though more even though this they are they they are similar to each other um, so the difference here is that isomorphism is technically is a bijection so it needs to be goes both ways so we have a perfect match Sim simulation instead is just uh, subjective so we need to map be able to map all the input to the output, but the, the opposite does not work. So, for instance, with the, that graph query here, G1, simulation itself can also match this one, which is disconnected. And that is something that we, we don't actually want. It's good to have some flexibility, but to match this connected graph uh, is probably not going to return structure that are relevant for the user. So, in this case, we are using strong simulation instead. Strong simulation adds some uh, constraint to the general simulation approach so that we still have some flexibility because we are just going one direction. We are looking if we can match from every node the child node of this. But strong simulation are the constraint that the output graph must be connected and the size of the graph uh, is bounded by the diameter of the bit. So in this case, we have a, a nice trade-off between allowing for flexibility and uh, retrieving answers that are compact and connected, so they are meaningful to the user. The question is how we find the structure efficiently in, in a large graph. The first idea, the first idea is to prune out the search space for nodes that are uh, for sure not going to be part of the answer. Uh, this approach is generic for graph simulation and graph isomorphism, and it works in the following way. For every node in the query, we are going to, to build a segment field. So for instance, for, every, for the node A, the signal will be an A is connected to a B node. And for B is the B to A node. At that point, we can take for each node their signature and go in the graph and remove all those nodes that do not match the signature. So in this case, we have removed this U node here because it's not connected to any B node. We know that node is not going to be part of our solution. This signature can, in this case, is a distance one, but we can build the also distance two or a distance three. So to which kind of nodes I'm connecting two hopes or three hopes. And once we have the signature, this can be uh, encoded as, byte, as a bit vector, so it's very fast to go into the graph, search every single node and move all of them. This is a, a conservative pruning so that we are sure that we are not going to move any, uh, any node that is not part of the solution. But uh, still, the search space is uh, quite vast. So the idea here is, OK, we want to restrict to only the region in the graph that is relevant, that match the topic of the user, the, the, the interest of the user. So in this case, we are going to use something we've seen earlier, personalized feature right? We use the user query as our seed set. We run personalized feature right? And then we give, we provide a scoring of all the nodes around. These are all the nodes that are highly connected. And since they are highly connected, they are probably relevant, especially in knowledge graph, where we have connection, for instance, the types of nodes uh, and similar the nodes that are relevant. So we personalize the trend. Now we are going to provide weights and we remove from the graph everything that is below some minimum threshold. This now uh, is not conservative as before because it means that some structures that we're going to remove, they can still match the user interest. 
But since they are far away from the user query, they uh, are probably not relevant for the user at all, like for the case of IT companies versus just general companies. This case is one of the cases where the importance of the relationship uh, plays a big role. Meaning that, as I said before, in the personalized page rank, if they are just web pages, links all have the same weight. But in this case, uh, links have a semantic, so we need to provide different uh, weight to these selections so that when we do the personalized search, it can skew the connection. And the, the idea to do this is to use uh, basically the frequency of edge labels in the graph. As I was saying earlier, edges that are less frequent are more uh, informative problems. So the acquisition edge is more informative than the location edge. With this idea, starting from the query, we, we, we restrict to a set, and then we can run as overflows just within that set of results or strong simulation. So we are pruning and then refining. This approach, as was shown earlier, requires a simple uh, full query, a structure that the user provides to us as well. But as we said in the beginning, we in an exploratory search uh, use case, the user may not have a clear idea of what is the structure to get the information of, uh, that they are interested in. So this is the case where we have multiple partial examples. So now the user provides to us pairs of examples that only partially match their interest. So an actor, supposed couple, director. And the question is, what is what are all the situations in the graph where this not these, but similar these structures, similar things are connected together. So we want to find all the possible substructures that connect them. Without knowing when we start, what is the connection between them, how they can be connected. So all of these are relevant, even though they have different, a different structure. So now the problem becomes combinatorial in theory because we need to provide try out all the possible combinations. And here in my example, I provide you just one edge per example, but you can imagine each of these structures can actually have uh, multiple edges in each one of them. So efficiency here becomes, again, um, an important factor. To solve this, we apply, again, a filter and refine approach. We exploit, again, the node signatures, and uh, you use them to identify different regions of the graph that potentially contain all these examples uh, somewhere uh, connected. Once we have these specific regions, then we can reduce our search space to that part of the graph and then find which are the uh, actual answers. So all the stuff, some structure that match all the, all the combination. So once again, we are exploiting this um, localized search and the filter and refine approach. And in this case, then we have a mixture because uh, we don't know, uh, we don't know exactly what we are looking for. And so uh, even though the synaptic relation is given is a structure isomorphism, in this case, is uh, actually uh, in between because we have some structures in that we don't know how the entire graph will look like. Generalizing this approach even more, we can have an example couple in this case because the input are nodes without knowing the connections. And this is similar to the reverse engineering approach for spark query that I showed earlier. So in, uh, in this case, we have multiple tuples, outputs, like in the previous approach, and we want to find how they are connected and then find other structures that 
um, that match, that provides the same output patterns. And in this case, we are using, again, uh, isomorphism in, uh, for, for, um, for determining which uh, structures are, uh, are relevant to the use of. The approach in this case uh, is um, bottom up. We start from the user input. And we build uh, um, what's called a maximal summer, meaning that we take the nodes on a single tuple and we look in the graph all the way that these nodes are connected. We build, we build a very large graph that connects all these nodes. And this is, we usually set a maximum size for this graph. And we say, okay, Italy, we would like to find an entire region of the graph that matches all these connections. But that will be, as for the case of the maximal aspect set, that will be uh, too restricted and also extremely complex to search. So the idea is that we start removing from this maximal graph edges until we are left with a graph that is uh, returning some other results. And uh, so we, are, we need to always preserve the connectivity, meaning that the nodes that the user provides the same need to be connected, there should be a path between them. And, but we can remove extra edges that we can add uh, around. So in this case, this is the, the full way. We start from the entity tuples. From the entity tuples, so just the nodes, we look what are all the connections around, the maximum query graph. Then we have a query lattice, meaning that up here is the maximum query graph with all the edges there. And here are all the combinations where we remove uh, some, uh, some of those edges. And here are all the, the leaf nodes, are all the um, subgraphs that contain only the minimum amount of edges required to keep the initial input connected. The search now is bottom up, meaning that we, we, we try to search for this, but this probably will turn a lot of results. So we start adding some edges, some additional edges. These are, this makes our answer more uh, topical, uh, more specific to uh, the user need. And we left the results in the string. At some point, we may add some edge that basically returns an empty result set of results with just the initial period there. And that is when we stop in the lattice. So we prune the lattice up there. And in this way, then we can find our uh, result numbers there. Okay, so we have seen example search methods for nodes and for structures, and we have seen different types of uh, similarity methods. Connectivity. So we don't look at any attributes on the nodes, we don't look at any attributes on the edges, we just look at proximity in the graph and allows to find communities, for instance, or clusters. We can look at properties, so just direct properties to describe a node. And in that case, we can find entities that share some common properties and expand entities. In both cases, we are searching for nodes. Then we're looking for structures, and then we have these two different approaches. On one side, we have the output the user provides, and we say, what are the queries that may have produced this output? So in this case, again, we are helping the user write a query without actually for, for them. They need to write any query language tool. While for structures, the idea is that we have some initial structure of input and it is of interest, and we want to find other substructures in the graph that connect them and describes and describes them. So when we look at connectivities and we look at uh, connectivity, sorry, and structures, then we are talking about having explicit similarity metrics. Connectivity is explicit, the input parameterize it. Similarity is explicit in structure, we have the input query uh, that parameterize, but we know what does mean similar. When we're looking for properties and queries, instead we are reverse engineering. We need to infer from the user input, what is what are the conditions that we want to apply? Important. I said at the beginning that 
uh, exploratory research and exploration in general is a high interactive process because the user who writes a bill gets a result, gets some understanding of the data, and given this understanding, provides a new query that usually is a reformulation or an adaptation. So search all customers that are older than six months. Okay, that customer is missing, let's say 12 months, but let's also add this other property and so on. This is the reformulation. So it's very important to be interactive. Despite this, there are very few processes and, and methods that actually optimize or learn from this interaction. This is an active area of research. How we can make this interactive and interaction means two things. One thing is, of course, learn the user, exploit what happened in the previous three queries to help the user find the next query. But interactivity is also about performance. So if every time I compute everything from scratch, I'm wasting a lot of work, how I can reuse work. And then there is an important part that applying machine learning. So learn from the user, not just at uh, a condition or through a certain space. That is an, uh, an important uh, next step. So here we have this new goal that either it is implicit or explicit, we want to add machine learning to interact with learn from the user interactions. If you see most of the approaches I showed you, they are one shot except for a couple, but we can provide some additional feedback. Most of them are one shot. Provide an input, this is my output. We want to learn and we keep learning. And that's the new interactive learning approaches. But in general, um, what I wanted to bring home is that there is this need to move from exploration as just profiling, as just giving you a broad view of my data, to something that provides the tail view that are uh, tailored for the user. So in this case, we, from the select count to find what are the attributes of interest, the accounts of interest, the structure of interest. And then this means that in exploration, we cannot expect the user to provide explicit, precise condition that describe the, their need. So this needs to be assumed that there are increasing needs, and in most cases, the user is not even aware of them, finds them later, recognizes them after some result of showing. Yes, this could be a property of interest. Now that I see that it correlates to my own, for instance. So exploratory systems need to support query refinement need to leverage the context, learn from the context, and the power of example of different approaches needs to be exploited also to provide an explanation. That's another important thing. The user provides an output, an input. These are accounts of interest. And the system provides, OK, these other accounts are good for you. Why? Explainability is an important part of this type of if we are inferring rules, we can show the user the rule. If we are reverse engineering a Spark query, we can provide the user the query. Hopefully, the user is able to read it. But if the matrix is more complex, how we can explain to the user what they're looking for? And then again, we need to remember that we need to support new hypotheses. So it's not enough to, the explanation is not just a reason to justify the output, the output of the system. Is also a way for the user to identify what could be important queries or important questions to ask next to the company and so on. So support new hypothesis. Again, interactivity and personalization. I hope I convinced you about the power of example-based approaches. Uh, the fact that we can help, they can help find information within unknown and familiar data, unclear information need. This is very important as part of the search, unclear information need even to the user. We want to exploit them by the semantics. So the connectivity is already some form of semantic, but of course, the knowledge is here, more information. And that's also um, easier for users because it's easier for users to come to you and say, these are 
some piece of information relevant to me instead of this is a query that is relevant. And that's and the last part is again about the data nodes. So almost daily there, are, there is some new data that is added that we don't know anything about. So even if you're expert in running queries, we may not be expert in the data. So how to write the query for that piece of data? Here I talk about graphs only, but as I said, it works for relational data. Right? So what you will see, reverse engineer Spark query, we can reverse engineer also. SQL queries. Uh, there are approaches that call about schema mapping. That's another important part, especially in integration. When we have two different databases and we need to see them within the same global view, then we need to do schema mapping. So I have customers in this table and customers in this other table. These tables are different. Uh, how do I map attributes to one to the other? Maybe on this table, if you join to another table to get all the information to the other. This is called schema mapping. Again, we can use examples. If you provide to the system example tables that are mapped, then the system can infer the rules. And then there is also the part about data repair, missing values, errors, computation errors. Data quality is a big, big issue in general. So if the user can find what are the rules that can fix the data or can fill in the missing values, oh, that would be extremely valuable. Again, examples are a good way to do this. For text, uh, well, the most simple thing will be this web page or this paper that I'm reading are relevant. Find me more of this. But there is actually more of that. For instance, on the web, we have web tables. Web tables are not really tables, are not in a relational database, they don't really have a schema, but they still contain some relevant information. Even a web table, can I find other web tables that contain the same kind of information or can I join them? This is the as textual or same structure with a search. And again, we can do it by itself. While for graphs, we'll see again community and search, reverse engineering queries, and structural queries. This uh, I repeat multiple times, the difference between this species similarity. And finally, and also about uh, possibility for uh, project and collaborations. So the idea is that a knowledge graph, after we have seen how to search things within a graph, but a knowledge graph can also be a bridge for other data models. So there is this concept of the data. A data lake is a place where a company throws all their data that say, okay, they are only one place. They are there, yes, but when we are going to search for them, then we have a big issue because we don't know what to search and how to search. A semantic data lake builds a knowledge graph on top of a data lake in order to link and index the content of data sets. Now, this can be used now for the user because I can provide you a small file, for instance, a file that contains I know it's available for me. And then I search in this one data for other data set that can augment it in some way so I can have new attributes or new rows and models. That is the vision of the semantic uh, data. And again, example based search is uh, a way um, that we are able to search in, within a semantic uh, data set by providing some file or, or data set of interest. And asking the user, the system to retrieve other considerations. Which is different. If you look around, you will see that there are some proposals that say, okay, we can match the entire structure of all the data to a knowledge graph, but that requires a lot of manual work. Instead, we can use uh, automatic entity linking instead of complete schema mapping to have an automatic indexing of the different data. This, of course, reduces a bit the procedure but removes all the manual work required in doing schema mapping, which again, because of data quality issues, they have to uh, increase. This is actually my lecture for today. And uh, I'm here to answer all your questions now.